Hello, Julian. Hello, Mike. And what are we going to talk about tonight? Tortoise willies. What? Tortoise willies. We're going to talk about tortoise willies. Yeah, yeah, tortoise willies and sugar glider willies and fossils. On tonight's veterinary ramblings, we're going to talk about willies and fossils with John Chitty. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Here he is. Hi, how are you doing, John? You all right? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, all right, thanks. Who was that applauding with a, with a, with a cry in the background there? Well, that's my parrot. <laughs> which is just kicking off right now. <laughs> so, so, what's their name? My, my cocktail is called Tubbs. Tubbs? Tubbs, yeah. Um, so it's named after two heroes of mine. One is, um, which Julian should get, um, and the other one is a former Australian cricket captain called Mark Taylor, who's called Tubbs. But Julian, you should get a comedian called Tubbs. Ah! Oh. Yes. Um, comedian called Tubbs, is Oh, no problem. God. An old one. Yep. <sighs> Was he vaudeville? Nope. It'll come back. Anthony Aloysius Ah. Hancock, of course, his, yes. Tubbs, Tubbs, was it? Tubbs, of course. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, what it's Tubbs. Tubbs. Yeah. That's what his co hosts used to call him on Hancock's Half Hour. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Tubbs, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Lived in yeah, North Cheam. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry yeah. South Cheam. South Cheam. Yeah. 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 Actually, it was East Cheam, I think. East Cheam. It was East Cheam. A railway <laughs> classic, anyway. So, uh, but yeah, it's, like, it's on Radio Four Extra. I do listen to it a lot, and it's still funny. Even ones I've heard many times before. It's just uh, oh, the delivery. It, it's hilarious. What one of the first ever Tony Hancock, um, Hancock's Half Hour uh, uh, episodes I, I listened to was the um, the Missing Page, and it's yeah. still my favourite. Some some people go to a lot of lengths to make sure they've got certain books in the bookshelf behind them, Jim. Have you? Have you yeah, well, we we have it. Don't have his angles. So here's, here's one of my bookcases there, which is um, well, that's nice. So we don't really, really um, I collect old books for a start, but um, also um, you know, just we just buy all like books, so we have a lot of those. But um, yeah, some interesting ones too. Um, kind of get a lot into old cricket books and Darwinian stuff like that. So and I've got quite a few really nice um fossil books too. So um, some Richard Owen originals, that kind of stuff. Right. Oh, lovely. Wow. I collect old books too. I've got some P.G. Woodhouse originals. Oh, I, I, I'm an avid collector of P.G. Woodhouse. But I also, I have almost an OCD on any old books about Pompeii. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have some some amazing books by a name who I've momentarily forgotten. A, a French archaeologist who spent quite a long time in uh, in Pompeii, doing unmentionable things to the um, one of the princesses of Italy at that time. Naples was uh, was a base of the royal family for a, a while in the late 1700s. And I, I was lucky enough to to get a half set of of the uh, the original volume of his drawings, the findings from uh, Herculaneum and Pompeii, and it's absolutely incredible that the detail and the care. That went in in those days, and, and I imagine the same really with, uh, with Richard Owen, the, yeah. the precision. It, it, exactly. You rarely find that these days. Yeah, because well, because they got photographs now, so we don't need it so mm. much. And mm. I think it's basically a different style because they had to draw everything, so it had to be like that. Best find, by the way, because always fun finding books when you're collecting. Was uh, it was in Australia? Came back to Darwin, which seemed to be more bizarre. But I went to stay with a friend. I was giving some talks at a conference out there. They were a friend near Sydney. We went to we went to see um. The Bowral, which is where Don Bradman uh, was brought up and played his cricket, is in Bradman Museum. So we went there. And on the way back, we stopped at this book barn. And on the table outside was this bargain table. And my friend said, Say, Holly's book, saying, Oh, bet this is dull. It's the essays of, of Reverend Wilberforce. I said, Hang on, <laughs> is that Soapy Sam Wilberforce? And yeah, it was the first edition, two volumes on his essays, which included the original review or a copy of review of or- on the origin of species, because he was supposed. Wow. That's where the trashing spell with the battle between Buxley and Wilberforce started. Absolutely, and yeah. Yeah. So that pair cost me 10 Australian dollars. It cost me about 20 more to have it posted back to the UK because I'd run out of luggage space, but that's mm. fine. 
that's still a bargain. But it's great actually reading through that. And always a big deal about this was no, they were not a loggerhead. Darwin and Wilberforce actually agreed completely because Darwin was profoundly uncomfortable um, with the whole theory, which why he didn't publish, why he waited till Wallace pushed it. Mm. And the thing is that both of them thought, hang on, we just got rid of slavery. This is saying that you know, it's evolution. Of course, they believe that I mean, you know, black was a, a person was a, was, a, was a prelim and it's all, we'd evolved from that, which is obviously absolutely untrue, but that's what they believed. And mm. so the reason they opposed um, natural selection was because it seems saying, yes, yeah, slavery's right, you can go back to it. And they didn't want to do that. They're only saying that. So Darwin was very reluctant and eventually pushed himself to do it because he thought it was the right thing to do. And Wilberforce opposed it, thinking, I don't want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. um, that's why the battle started, which is just kind of cool. And the review is brilliant. I mean, you just read it. It's really superb book review. Probably not one you'd want on one of your books. but, uh, but, no, but that's <laughs> it's really, it's really really Amazing, cool. amazing, incredible. And of course, th there, have been, th there were at the time so many different essays produced to, to either refute Darwin's suggestions of evolution or to categorically prove them. And one of the essays, I forget who it was by, gave the most wonderful proof of evolution by comparing bilateral and radial symmetry mm. and saying there is no way that, that animals would have come naturally in a bilaterally symmetrical form and in a, a, a radial a radially symmetrical form without evolution occurring you know way back in the midst of time and, and even so you've got a starfish a, a, a radially symmetrical Sea cucumbers, to some extent, are. Um, <laughs> oh, what else? What else? What else? We have? Yeah, there's what else a we word. Have? There's a word for a person. Mm -hmm. like you. you can have your whiskey. I'll say sea uh, urchins. Sea urchins. Oh. Are, sea urchins, of course. Five, there's five raid symmetry. Sorry, before <laughs> before we got you on here, I said I'm going to warm myself a whiskey if I can somehow get sea urchins, sea urchins into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go and there i go have you ever eaten sea urchin John? yes it was disgusting i thought it was disgusting um i've got a feeling we cooked it wrong because um, we bought it in south of france and cooked our own but i must have had something on, on a stool there as well to see if it was just us but i thought it was pretty disgusting then too so <laughs> i actually, I actually love shellfish and seafood but um i, I wasn't stuck on sea urchin <laughs> I, I guess i guess it's my i, I love it it, it is okay. it's my it is my favourite food. My favourite is octopus, and um, particularly on this. Absolutely oh, adore. Yeah, I played. Um, oh, but you know, um, typical Galician octopus. You know, it's with Pepe Propica, um, especially in the centre centre of Madrid. There's a beautiful market mm. there, which is just an open air tapa. Love it. Oh, well, we we do a we do a recipe of um, uh, slow cooking it as own juice first, and then stewing it in red wine. Mm, nice, and it's uh, it's, it's delicious. Yeah, absolutely, no, absolutely adore octopus. I'm, I'm so, going to put think... myself in the waiting room here. <laughs> no, jo jo join in. Talk, talk to us about mollusks you've eaten. No, no, I'm, well, <laughs> no, because you'll get me all upset about octopuses or octopi. Octopodes. Yes. Um, Octopodes. Um, it's a bad joke because um because my younger daughter did classics for a while and it became a thing where we um we, we, a debate came up about what's the plural of octopus and uh, right. octopi. Octopuses. And she said, no, she said, drawing it full height, it's octopodes. It is, it is octopodes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you, you are uh, a vet who sees an awful lot of exotic animals, aren't you? The correct term is a advanced practitioner, apparently, but there we go, whatever. <laughs> I see a lot of them, yeah, whatever. And b because of you and your wonderful advice, I have a mutilated tortoise. But no, don't worry, he, he's fine. He's doing well. He's doing very well. I'm not responsible for what you did when I advised you to do something different. You, no, 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 you did. No, you know? no, he, he did it, and he's been racked with guilt ever since. Yeah, he's quite uh, right, too. His tortoise counselling sessions, he's completely reversed the hierarchy between his two male tortoises. Come on, Julian, tell tell our audience on Veterinary Ramblings what you have done to your tortoise. I, I Actually, you better, better tell them why you did it first. One of my tortoises had a, a penile prolapse. Uh, and poor chap had a you know a willy that just wouldn't go away again, and it was getting uh, getting dried out and damaged. Uh, and so, quite rightly, John advised me to amputate the penis. And this poor tortoise has looked at me balefully ever since. But he's happy and healthy and eating well. 
That's fine. And he's earning lots of money on tortoise porn sites. That's only if you sew it back on again, Julian. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, so it was, a, it was a little bit premature calling him John John Wayne Tortoise. Robert. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> Robert the Tortoise. Or with the daughters. So we, Mike and I, Mike and I were talking about Willies earlier, and uh, I'm um, sure. as, 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 as we often as we often do, and um, sugar gliders, mm. of course, have have two. No, they have one, but oh, it's they, four. We, yeah, that's right. Yeah, a urethral. Yeah, and the amusing thing is they reintroduce between the two the fork. So um, mm. yeah, quite yeah. cool things um, um, uh, gliders. That's because they do the intrauterine um, insemination. So, so what, what one fork goes to each each, each um, horn of the uterus or each part of the uterus is, is two separate uterine. Oh right, oh, I didn't know that. They were really popular as pets a few years back. Are they? Are you still seeing a few? Or uh... yeah, loads. Um, we we so mostly 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 castrating them. Probably do two three dozen castrates a year, really. So yeah, they're actually one of the easiest smaller mammals to to castrate, aren't they? Well, yeah. Well, the castration option is really simple. It's just basically you remove a whole scrotum, you know, called mm. palm off. And um, the big deal is stopping them chewing themselves to pieces afterwards. Uh, and that's what they are inclined to do. Maybe once they start chewing, they'll go through to intestine level and everything. So the big deal mm. is trying to get nerve blocks in place so they don't feel anything, make sure everything's hidden, and also mm. try and get it as stress-free as possible. So we'll often actually knock out a whole colony um, just to castrate one. So you all come in the same experience. They all smell the same. They go straight back. We do it on an outpatient basis, which is not how we do most things. Um, mm -hmm. But just get it back in the environment, its own environment ASAP and just try and stop it chewing. Interesting. Seems to work most of the time, touch wood. But. You, you don't use anything like gabapentin or, or one of the uh, nerve modulators? It's like all these things is, I mean, gabapentin for a start is supposed to take several days to action anyway. Also, there's no study on a dose rate or, um, you know, what... Um, effect it's going to have on a sugar glider they're kind of a bit weird anyway so yeah. my yeah. drug and sugar glider doesn't seem a great idea we do tend to use opiate rather than NSAID for just to get it quiet for a, for a few hours afterwards just to just to um, yeah. hopefully make you forget about things but local block primarily um just make sure it doesn't doesn't feel much at all at the time right right and do you tend to use a longer acting um no, so bupivacaine or mepivacaine yeah, or... yeah so we use um bupivacaine um, as um as a block and then we'll put splash on as well and um yeah just hopefully that, that seems to seem seems to stop from getting at it too it seemed to be quite happy afterwards and we, we don't have a, a high failure rate with that so we tried using not necessarily on sugar gliders but on, on any of your patients we tried using any of these ultra long acting uh local anesthetics the um, lysosomal bonded ones no no i haven't done yet so they're, they're um, amazing might, yeah might, might be well worth a go so um might get some tips off you afterwards, Julian. So it'll be good because actually, yeah, is the thing we just try and experiment again. You're never quite sure what the pharmacology is going to be. Great talk by Rebecca Step in years ago, and she said, um, you know, exotic animal pharmacology is is fireside tales, and that's really mm -hmm. what it is. Mm, so we right. try things and we we observe something. We think, well, okay, fine, this happened, therefore it's because of that word, not always. Um, so that's why there's such often such a wide dosage range. Why there's um, um, do I actually look at thinking, well, that can't be affected there because it doesn't work like that, but it's it's up there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's all about experimenting and seeing and trying to interpret what you're seeing. And yeah, chatting so to your friends and saying, I use this. Yeah, or, exactly. Or I've got this patient, what, what, what do you use? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And trying things like that because, you know, some science behind it, you know, it should work like that. What is the length of action? We've got to test it out there. I think the big thing you'll bear in mind with when we're dealing with sort of exotic areas is that you're not dealing like dogs, which is primarily one species, maybe breed differences, but it's one species. Mm -hmm. Now you start looking at reptiles and, and birds into thousands. Even with mm. pet trip, you're looking at hundreds of thousands. So yeah. you know, it's very really hard to say because it works in this bird, it's going to work in that bird, and at the same level of the same amount of time. And there's some really interesting studies. Um, uh, what's the thing? Look at um, tramadol is a good example. Very different dose rates between raptors and parrots, um, uh, and, and um, you know, and so forth. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. So is is tramadol effective in in birds generally as a pain reliever? Because it, there's a great deal of question about whether it's at all effective in dogs yeah um whether it's a converter or not um yeah because you know dogs and the like people have got to be a converter if you don't convert it is you might as well give sugar water and i'm sure that's been the same across the board i mean rabbits i've got some you can give it to nothing seems to happen others is even remarkably effective um but yeah with the birds again trouble with birds is especially parrots 
doing a pain study on them because they're pretty bright. So if mm. you go up to it and hurt it and then you know, give it a drug and see what, see what hurts it more or less, you do that to it once, it knows what's going to happen the second time. So they start reacting before you even do anything. So you can't really do a placebo stuff because it's going to, it's going to think things can happen. So that starts throwing the experiment left, right and centre. There's a few force plate studies coming through with lame ones with um, more sort of experimental based um, arthritis things. But again, mm. slap into real life, but it's getting better. But actually, the, the, it's, there's lots of PK work or more PK work, but not mm -hmm. so much a way of actually, does this drug actually work? Here's, here's an effectiveness study. I saw, I saw an article earlier on um, talking about crows, which touches on what you were talking about there, John, because um, crows can recognize human faces. Mm. Yeah, in fact, Lorenz did that in the first place, yeah. Yeah, and they can teach their cohorts to recognize a face. Mm. Yep. It really? Really? So they, they can communicate to the, the extent that they can say, well, that, that, that bloke over there, he'll give you peanuts and that one won't. Yeah, you see that ball bloke down there? Yes. Stay away from him because he knows nothing at all about, about whatever. And he wants, <laughs> to, he wants to talk about sea urchins all the time. <laughs> all about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. same thing. I, I, so it, have you, you've obviously come across this then, John. Actually, really, if you want a really good book to read, it's um, a chap called Bernd Heinrich who studied um, ravens, massive study on that. Um, so you've got one book called Bert Mind of Raven and stuff, really good book. And um, some of the, a lot of the intelligence level of those things are, it's incredible. They really are bright. Um, so yeah, well worth the read. I, I, I mean, you giggle now, because all I can think of now is Peter Cook and Dudley Moore in their not only <laughs> rules. So. Keep your ravens to fly underwater. Yeah, yeah right. so it's a rather stream greebling here. I spent most of my life trying unsuccessfully to teach ravens to fly underwater. <laughs> It's actually one of the things, um, I've been very Cornish, I've got, um, I've obviously been planning my funeral for quite a long while, um, and uh, it's one of the things I do actually want read at my funeral is that sketch of teacher ravens flying the water, if nothing else, that's the reason, that ha ha has, your, has, your, has it, been, it been, been, been a success, to which your response is, no, I can honestly say my entire life's work has been a complete and utter failure. <laughs> that's right, my, my life has been a miserable failure, and and a complete waste of time. <laughs> that's of course, that's good. She also has the immortal line about Lady Street grieving. Uh, she, a uh, lady who could break a swan's wing with one blow of her nose. A blow of her nose, that's right. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful dancer, wonderful dancer. 97, <laughs> still dancing. <laughs> she, she said to me uh, as a young lad, I was only 47, she said, Sir Arthur, I want you to go out now and start teaching ravens to fly underwater. And I think it was about then that I started my life's quest. Very powerful woman. <laughs> yes, wonderful sketches. Pete, no, it was fantastic sketches, yeah. I, I did the between that and that's obviously one leg guitars. I mean, everybody likes one leg guitars, but I thought ravens oh. underwater is the one to go with. Fantastic. And, and the one leg guitars, if anyone hasn't seen or heard it, uh, I suggest you go and, and look at it or listen to it. it. It has the longest setup line, I think, in comedic history. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. I, I've got, I like your right leg. As soon as I came in, I thought, hello, I thought, there's a lovely leg for the role. What a great leg for the role, I thought. I've got nothing against your right leg. The problem mm. is, neither have you. Exactly. It is, it is, it is, uh, yeah, it's one of the greatest sketches ever. I mean, it's just hilarious. And if nothing else, it's just one of those typical um, comedy things, a bit like them and Monty Python, where simply how many ways can you describe a one legged man in, in the English language? Yes, uh, yes. And I, I think we're lucky there, aren't we? It's a monopod. Uh, you, you, a monopod. A yes. one legged artist. You're role for a unidexter. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I think we, we do have this wonderful redundancy of words in the English language that they don't yeah. perhaps have in uh, American. In, in American. Yeah. Well, they, 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 they do, but most of the uh, redundant words we have that we didn't use anymore after 1800, we gave to the Americans. Yeah. Uh, but the, <laughs> but the, the, the French, uh, I, I think, have a very narrow range of, of words for each scenario. Uh, whereas we have incredible words that, that, that are hardly ever used. I managed to get the word uh, crepuscular into a sentence the other day. Uh, I was, I was, I was, 
I was, in, I was in a Zoom meeting and it was getting a bit dark. I said, Terry, sorry, this crepuscular light is just not really suiting the camera very well. And I don't think the French would, would, would have that, poor, poor people. Um, I think it do. The trouble is, because French is a, it's got all got to be ratified by a central body, hasn't it? So, like, um, mm. we always say about rules of English, or actually, no rules of English, because there's no body that sets the rules speaking English. So there's a few tomes come out, and everybody says, Oh, that's really good. So, we'll have that for a bit, and then it gets changed by somebody else. So, English evolves. And of course, it's that avaricious language, it takes words from everybody. Mm. Um, so, therefore, we get lots of words things because somebody goes to India, takes a few words from there. We take a few words from, from Latin, from you know, Anglo Saxon, from everywhere. So yes. it's cool. So I have I have to disappoint you, Julian. Yes. It's corpuscular. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Thank, thanks for the <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the correction. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm just I was, I'm, obvious, I'm, really. I actually nearly said it, but I had to look it up <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> um, so what? Um, you, you're, you're you're busy at the moment, are you? In in, in lockdown, still busy? Yeah, so work wise, massively busy. Um, mm. Everything takes twice as long, and yeah, it's been um, a long old year, really. Um, so yeah, like most venting clinics, we're yeah. creaking a bit, um, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been quite a toll on on, on all of us, really. Um, uh, and and even those those furloughed, I mean, I'd say even those furloughed, those furloughed had different strains, different stresses. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been, Interesting back has been, been interesting, and um, you know, I, you, you look at some people who still got mental effects from that, and certainly mm. those working, it's been really, really hard. Um, as in a, a very different way, and I think you know, looking at the stress at stress levels in the clinic, it's it's been tough. It's been really tough, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's got a lot of admiration of my colleagues. It's one thing when you own the clinic and it's your business you're kind of looking after and doing stuff for. When it's not to keep going through it and work even harder and do stuff there, uh, you know, that does take quite a lot. And um, yeah, they've been yeah. great. It really does. I think um, I can echo that. Um, and my, my assistants have been absolutely amazing. Good. Absolutely incredible during this time. But they, they seem to pull an extra something from, 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 uh, from the reserves. Even just cheering up a miserable git of a boss, really. You know, it's like, oh God, he's in a bad mood again tomorrow. Let's cheer him up. That's somebody they do that, which is really, really lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you're a miserable, John. I, I can't believe that. Been, quite frequently. <laughs> but we we have a hard enough job as as small animal vets, um, getting history from owners, and the history is usually fairly basic. But with um, with the exotics, the history must form 90% of the clinical picture. And so... Same as animal, though, isn't it? That, that's, that's the same thing. Listen, what's he, again, another old quote, listen to your client, he's telling you a diagnosis. It's true. It's true enough. Okay. Um, but you're, so you, you have more clients coming into the practice, you, you're collecting them from outside. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, in terms of that small animal exotics, all of it. Mm. I mean, there, I can really... At the moment you doubt your, your career choice, and I think as you get older, some of them get a little bit more frequent, but um, certainly standing in the pitch black at about half past five on a December night when it's a howling gale, it's pouring down. Uh, you are in the most charming, professional set of Anton Vest um, fluorescent um, workwear, and you're trying to get a history from somebody in a car while you're both wearing masks so you can't hear anything and you can't see facial expressions. And you just sit there thinking, what am I doing in my life? Uh, and that's, I think that's really is. And so, you know, I think like most clinics, we find that we've, you know, we're having many more problems with clients and complaints and with, mm. and so we've released out mm. twice in the last six months for clients who've really kicked off them. The reactions are very extreme, which I think reflects the stress levels in everybody. But most reason why these things happen is because communication is so, so difficult. Yeah. Um, so you do take, in all honesty, you don't take the same history you would sat in a consulting room. You don't go th talk to talk them through the, looking at the animal. You don't press them and say, hey, feel this as well, or look at this, or I'm funny. Hang on, I've just seen this. Can I ask you another question now? So you're thinking, oh, do I really want to put the animal back in the basket and walk back out and ask another question and go back? Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Uh, and it's, uh, it does lead to communication problems, uh, and, and that's been a big, a big problem. And yeah, I liken it to people ask about it. I, I might, well, normal thing I say to them is, um, I used to be a vet. Now I just treat animals. Yeah, that's a 
it's a very good way of looking at it, isn't it? It's true. The, 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 the job, the professional life has changed over the last year incredibly. Mm. Um, yeah. It's uh, the great part of my the love of my job is actually building that relationship with the clients over their pets' yeah. health and illness. And we've lost yeah. that for the moment. Absolutely. It's really difficult to maintain. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you know, we, again, we all whinge about that, the bad ones. And there are some days you come home to feel like you've been duffed up. Um, mm. And some have been. Uh, but um, we had some lovely, we had one lady who brought in um, through the summer when it's really hot, twice a week she brought in ice, a box of ice lollies um, for everybody. Wow. Just oh, wonderful. wonderful. So, um, you know, that, that was just, just fantastic. She, we loved it a bit. She, she got free vaccine for life at that point. Um, and so, <laughs> when we got cold, she started bringing cup of soups. Um, which is a bed box of a cup of soups, and just think, you know, what a lovely person. So, we've, we've had absolutely fantastic people, and most people have been really nice. And hmm. you know, you stopped in the car park occasion, so we said, oh, How's it going? He said, Oh, well done, you keep going, it's great, you know, you're doing a good job. And thinking, Wow, you know, these moments really keep you going, they really when, do. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's pluses and minuses. So, we all dwell on the negatives, there are some good bits too, and I yeah. think there are some bits which we really take forward. I mean, one of the bits we've started doing more, always a bit with exotics, we always had stuff emailed in earlier so we know we'd, we'd often ask them to send in pictures of bibs and uh, and mm -hmm. setups and uh, we probably do it a lot more now than we used to and you know, videos for for how the animal's behaving at home more people are going to uh, email that in before we get there and it's a damn good idea so we, we do that more and probably take that forward more to get more prelim data coming mm. in the, the contact before we actually see the animal so that, that's gonna be a good thing yeah yeah absolutely i think it's, it's good to try and get some positives out of the the, the whole pandemic and then and, and you're right some of these changes are, are really going to stick but we for example are, are going to see fewer post-op cases because we've discovered that actually the majority of times a photo and uh, an email will do absolutely yeah exactly i mean it's you know lots of wound things you know what you do you think about you you have i think about practice economic stuff you know have a you know have a 10 15 minute appointment booked out for a post-op wound check and fundamentally you say, How, how's he doing? Oh, he's absolutely fine. Let's have a look at his castration wound. Oh, yeah, that's great. Looking fine. Okay, off you go. So you've had it booked out there. You, it's, a, it's a no charge appointment. You know, you've you, you've spent probably 30 seconds. Mm. Um, probably try and spend two minutes more um, talking about the football match and then two minutes more trying to think, well, how can I make this lease look like it's worth having? Um, and it's, you know, it, it is actually just effective sending away those things in by whatever. And you haven't stressed the animal out. You haven't stressed the animal. You haven't given the owner an hour's round trip to, yep. to take time out to, to come along for you just to say, yep, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and and it gives more time then for those people who do have a concern post-op. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, and also you've got things like um, some of the prescription checks. And I think there are things you definitely need to listen to. You definitely get your hands on. But certainly some of the lamest ones is, you know, I, mean, I don't know if you ever tried trotting up a lame rabbit. Um, but they, they, tend to, they tend to freeze on the floor and stand there and actually they don't move. It's kind of impossible. So actually the video, the person brings their rabbit moving at home and seeing mm. how it moves is way more effective. It's way better. I'm sure it is, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so you're basing everything on the remote data anyway, rather than what you've just seen. So, you know, if you see the rabbit once a year for its vaccines and the six months you check by remote, as long as you, know, you pick up the problem, you're fine bringing in then. There's no obvious problem. The weight the owner can do as well at home for you. If they were that stable, you know, there's an awful lot of things you can do remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of things yeah. you can't do as well. I think we found that as well. But um, um, I think I have tried doing one of my rare dog ones. I did a dog one because everybody was busy. And I did a dog at Otis Externa a remote one, which was, um, I can honestly say, absolutely hopeless. Uh, it was it. <laughs> especially they had one go and find the dog. And secondly, I then got a very blurred ready or held up to the camera which didn't overall help very much at all <laughs> <laughs> well the practice yeah, favorite yeah. is the person who said well can we see the cat now and um and the owner said well what do you mean you want to see the cat it's up a tree do you want to see the cat <laughs> <laughs> so yeah please well we, we we had a photo sent in this was six months or so ago now a uh, photo sent in by by a client saying it my, my cat has developed this weird rash on its ear and she'd taken the photo as a selfie and the only way she could get her cat still was pressing it up against her chest and so she'd taken a picture of, of, of basically of her, her chest 
and I'm sure there must have been a cat's ear there somewhere because you told me there was, but I, I honestly don't remember ever seeing it. <laughs> I, I think I think the big thing about viewing a picture, Julian, is of course always saying you're going to sort of zone out of your mind the peripheral detail and hone in on the actual focus bit, you know, the bit you're supposed to look at. Um, um, that's what you're supposed to, do, Julian. Um, I, I recommend in that case. Could, couldn't um, zone out. Just couldn't do it. Just couldn't zone out. <laughs> Mo moving back on to more serious topics, we we um, uh, gave you a challenge, didn't we? Did you did you read that in the in the rules? Was this the 60 second one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, we, we discussed on email too. And I promised you I'd do ferrets in 20 seconds. <laughs> you did. So you're going to do ferrets in 20 seconds three times then? No, I just thought we'd talk about something else for 40 seconds. Or you or you can merely, if you like, you can applaud for 40 seconds. I'm quite easy either way. Well, there can be 40 seconds of questions, can't there? I, I, actually, <laughs> hang on a minute. I, I, saw a, I saw a comedian last night and she said, just to, um, do you know, since the start of my career, whether it's been small clubs, bars, sold out auditorium, theatres like this one, ever since my first ever show, I have always received a standing ovation. <laughs> Three minutes long. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> so she set the whole thing up for this three minute standing ovation, including timing it, just to make sure that it was full. <laughs> yeah, gosh. I said, I've just bought a ticket for 180 quid for a, for a one night uh, concert. This is, it's not really a concert, it's this guy talking about resurrection. I thought, well, it's a lot of money, but hell, you only live once. Bit of tumbleweed there. So what you have to do, John, is just stay really, really still for a second. Really, really still. Just pretend it's all closed, exactly that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, then he thinks it's glitching. And, <laughs> and then he, he all starts to panic a little bit. And then, oh, then actually, while okay. well, well, there's this pause, <laughs> it reminds me, watch out for pickpockets at the moment. Uh, my friend David lost his ID. He's only Dav now. Yeah. <laughs> you did say these are quite heavily edited, didn't you, Mike? Yeah, they're heavily edited. Don't, 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 don't worry. I've, I've, I've got a whole, I've got a whole series of notes here, look, John. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're all there. Most of them are Julian going on cut. Julian going on cut. Julian put in waiting room. <laughs> Keep. <Cut. laughs> Nicely played, Jackie Weaver. Come on, so you, you're up for this 60 second okay. CPD challenge, are yeah. you? Ready when you are, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's make sure your microphone's on. I'll, I'll dip out of here. So, John Chitty, 60 seconds CPD on ferrets, starting now. Excellent. Well, to coin a phrase, um, a ferret is a cat that looks like a weasel. So, if you see a ferret, um, then if you treat it like you would a cat with very similar signs, then you won't go too far wrong. And that's actually 12 seconds, which I think is under 60, whatever Mike likes to say. But that's basically your approach to ferrets, is treat them like cats, you'll be absolutely fine. That's it. We can now reflect for the next, um, I believe we have 35 seconds to go, so we do a lot of reflection. We can think about the outcomes from that too. Um, and I think that'd be great. <laughs> would, you, would you take questions? I think the aim of all things in life, Mike, is you've got to leave them wanting more. I suspect that might do. What, like 40 seconds more? <laughs> well, absolutely. It's It's been a feature of my life in oh so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> that may be, I guess, in terms of CPD, to be termed um, premature reflection. <laughs> well, you, you keep mentioning this, and, and, and actually, you know, as, as we we discuss every week on on veterinary remedies, that uh, it's not proper CPD unless we reflect upon the CPD that we've received. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to try again for the reflection. We have to look wistfully into the into the um distance. Yeah, yeah. Three so. mm. Let's reflect on the CPD that John has provided for us this evening. I always think this is awkward for people listening. Yeah, but, I mean, it's not well, great radio. I mean, it's in fairness, I don't think it's great visually either, is it, really? It's, it's not brilliant either way, but, but it's important. Yeah. And, and, it's a, and it's an RCVS requirement, so we need to do it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I believe we have. I mean, yeah. I think we can... Have you, can you write, actually, we've got 10 seconds to write in our logs as well, that way, too. Oh, brilliant stuff. Brilliant. I've already filled that in. 
talking of ferrets, we had we had one lecture on ferrets when I was a vet student. Wow, that's one, more than I one, had. One one hour lecture. It was an American uh, ferret expert or mustelid expert. He was talking about um, whether to castrate, uh, sorry, vasectomize male ferrets or, or whether to, um, uh, to to treat female ferrets to prevent osteoporosis due to lack of, um, of, 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 of stimulation. Because that was the old thing, wasn't it? Yeah, also, oh, oh, you think you mean um, um, estrogen um, anemia? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. Yeah, so it's one of the things, yeah, you can, you can use um, a, a vasectomized hob for, um, mm. for, for groups of them. And, and otherwise, and this, you're stimulating as well, which is not so reliable and, and probably a good way to get bitten quite easily and probably and actually cause a lot of damage occasionally. So, well, well, I, think, I think a very good way because this chap said what you can always do is stimulate the, uh, the, the female with a q tip. Now, we didn't know because at that time, you know, it may not be a message ago, to take home, Julian. <laughs> well, I, I, I had a q tip because I used to play a lot of snooker and I thought, you've got to be really brave, haven't you? you Hold still, hold still. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get. There we go. We're gonna go for the Q-tip, and oh, I potted the black. But yeah, um, I mean, I, I, a grave risk of causing offence. I guess that sort of um, Q-shot. You're gonna put a lot of, um, should I say, side on it. <laughs> not a spin on the brown. I think sometimes, but yeah, um, definitely, no, no, uh, definitely no deep screw. <laughs> definitely no deep screw. But apparently, a, a, a Q-tip is, is a is a cotton bud. Yes, it is. Really? Yeah. Mm. So, and and I've tried actually both ways, and you cannot play snooker with a cotton bud. This doesn't work at all. No, <laughs> no. And nor does snooker with a ferret very well either. You keep going you know, down the holes and around the place. And... <laughs> or if you're a Yorkshireman, of course, you put them down your trousers. Absolutely. Exactly who, that. Who, who, was, who was it that told us that ferrets are the fastest growing pet in America at the moment? Dale, wasn't it? Steve, Steve Dale, yeah. Apparently, ferrets are yeah, really, really huge in America at the moment. Yeah, have been for a while actually. Um, um, and very sort of different sort of level of produ- type of production to over here, but Ooh. yeah, actually, and to be honest, they're really popular over here as well. We see a lot of ferrets, and um, I think those numbers are growing, uh, especially. You know, and it's actually one of those areas really changed from when I graduated a long time ago. Um, and you look at a ferret, it'd be average life expectancy about two years old, they're all um, they're fed on bread and milk, they're all working animals. Um, and now we're looking at um, quite regularly see ferret, ferrets get to 10 years old. Um, almost all pet animals, um, um, many of them in short, you know, it's kind of a different, different ball game altogether. Yeah. So it's actually, I think, a bit, bit, a bit of a success in many ways. And it's that thing about, you know, why are cancers more, more prevalent? And then, well, actually, a large part of it is because they're living long enough to get them. Um, there are mm. other factors as well, but you know, a large part is that you know, these suddenly we've got animals who actually live long enough to get old age disease. Yes, yes. And, and and we're getting better at recognising the signs and we're getting better at, at, at diagnosing. But, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Before... And actually, that's, 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 a, that's a really good point because that thing about recognising signs and across all the small furry sort of brigade, heart disease, you say, God, it's massive. Actually, you no, know, we just didn't see it, but we didn't recognise it, you know. We picked up on post-mortem, we didn't see it pre-mortem before. And now we're actually seeing the signs, we're recognising it earlier, mm. we're beginning to treat it, but, yeah. Owners so, yeah. generally are getting better, aren't they? They're getting better informed and, and, and better able yeah. to, to to look after their animals doesn't always happen i know that still a lot of exotic problems are due to husbandry aren't they it, um, inadequate that, that's and always one of those things so if you want you, you want a soapbox to really get started there it's a thing oh exotic pets all about husbandry uh what about dog and cat disease you know what's the yeah. biggest problem with dogs obesity or lack of socialization or this type of thing um you know those are husbandry problems so we see it in all of them, you know, what we see brachycephalic um, dogs, cats, rabbits, all of them. You know, these are breeding problems. These are husbandry problems. Um, it's there in all our pets. Uh, and, you know, the problems you see in exotics simply mirror what you see in dogs and cats, a uh, different type of them in some ways. But, yeah, fundamentally, it's the same in all of them. That's um, true. Yes. Alpha have got to be looked at as pet wide rather than being just exotic pets. It's all of them. And a mm-hmm. good keeper keeps them all up and a, and a, and a, and a poor keeper doesn't. Um, are so yeah, I, you know. are there any particular things then, John, for for ferret keepers or potential ferret keepers, for example? What what should they be looking, or what would you advise them or, or guide them on to to make sure their husbandry is tip top? Ah, I mean, ferrets actually, 
ferrets are one of the more bomb proof um, creatures. Um, but I mean, basically, a big thing usually with ferrets is probably, you know, again, we want to check for weight. Um, they, they, it's really difficult deciding either weight for a ferret. I mean, they'll actually vary body weight by about, about a third through the year because they put on weight during winter, lose it in the spring. And it's a massive weight shift. It's like, what's the normal weight for a ferret? Well, what, when are we talking about? Um, so Maybe you can, I'm part ferret. I've said that many times. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's absolutely the truest thing you've said all evening. <laughs> You're all hard, John. <laughs> I miss you on the committees, I really do. <laughs> same goes, same goes, same goes. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, what do you look at for in, in the pet fair? I mean, again, it's that signs of health, spotting it, body condition is always that thing rather than that's your numbers for that. Um, make sure we're active so you know you can take them for walks and i spare harness you can get taken for walks so they get in which case get vaccinated you can put tubes up in the garden like the ferret races you see um you know part of zoos and stuff you know and do that mm -hmm. they love it I mean, it's great fun um and um you know keep so keep them active keep them stimulated um uh, again, look at breeding control is probably a big thing with ferrets and again probably looking more at doing the hormone implants rather than doing um surgical neutering um, so that's super Lauren you tend to use. Super Lauren, yeah, exactly. So yeah. um, there is only one brand of it, so I guess we can mention brand names. So there we go. We, we we normally say other brands are available, but in this case, there is only one. Not, so, yeah. It's not so. So yeah, so I mean they're they're really effective, and again, get away from that dream van problem. But um, yeah, I mean they're they're actually super pets, uh, and um, again, all of it's about trying to maintain a good high protein, high fat diet, very few carbs. Um, and again, using a really, so we're using a really good brand of ferret food. Make sure the quantity is right. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And they are, they're really intriguing pets, aren't mm -hmm. they? They're fascinating. Yeah. I used yeah. to keep them, I was, um, and I obviously love them. They're, they're, they're great, they're really funny. The type of pet, I think really people like them, is you come home from a stressful day in the office or whatever, and they just make you laugh. They do something really dumb and funny, and they just make you laugh. They're, they're really, really cool animals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and they they keep well with, with a, they keep well they they're easily kept with a, a fairly small uh, enclosure because yeah I mean you can get you gotta, yeah exactly you got to let them out for, for periods of exercise but fundamentally sorry they're like all small um, carnivores you know, they don't do very much most of the time you know, they'll, they'll get out hunt feed then go to sleep for the rest of the time mm. so they don't need to be continuously doing stuff but they do need some enrichment um, uh, things. And they do need to be able to, to do exercise for part of a day. Mm -hmm. And they're usually quite happy with that. So yeah. Enrichment's actually a, a good word to 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 use for 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 any pet. Yeah. We used to yeah. we used to talk about enrichment for vivariums and enrichment for, for aviarism, enrichment for, for basically caged animals. Yeah. But uh, that 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 um, general assumption that the Animals that aren't in a cage can make their own entertainment. Uh, we, we now know really to be vastly untrue. Yeah. Dogs and cats need enrichment in their lives. We need enrichment in our lives as we discovered over the last year of lockdowns. Yeah, exactly. It's always a funny thing because I think it helps with, you know, having done zoo work in the past where a huge amount of time and resource is put into doing enrichment and stuff, and especially feeding enrichment. Um, and you look at all this and it's, it always seems very strange to go back into a dog and cat thing where you say, you know, it's in all the other animals, you know, feeding enrichment. So with big cats, things, we're doing bones, doing this, everything else. So you go back to a surgery and it's back to dogs. Oh, you've got to have a, have a, have a, have a bowl full of kibble and that's it. And thinking, well, there's nothing enriching about that at all. You know, that, that's the <laughs> thing. Really and it's, 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 if you like, it's behavior budgets, it's doing something about finding its food and doing something with it. And okay, it's a bowl full of food. It's, it's just eating it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yes, I mean, but Richmond's absolutely true. And I think it's a nice paper record, wasn't it? Or mentioned a record last couple of weeks about yeah. cats played with and occupied. They don't go out and hunt and kill birds, which is always a good thing. Yes, um, yeah, so. that's right. The, the veterinary record, the, uh, the, the the British Veterinary Association Journal uh, did, did have that, that article in. And, and uh, we, for a long time, we've had little cat toys around uh, that, that our, our two cats and our dog actually all, all play with. Um, the thing is, we have to instigate that, and so yeah. you can get as many dog and cat toys as you want, but unless you spend the time interacting with them and getting them to play with it, then you're just wasting <laughs> the money. They're just ornaments that are 
that you trip over. I think you also got to look at it as being um, a bit like toys for kids and stuff. Is it's not just getting the toy. You've got to rotate them. You got to do things. Now. If you give a kid the same toy every day, you know, if you, every kid's got a favourite for a long time. But but most of the time, you've got to be rotated. You've got to change. You really want variety. So it's no good just putting it there. And again, it's got to have a point to it. It's got to do something. It's got to give a reward <laughs> as well. As just um, the words just be a toy. Otherwise, you know, it's about you know, past about ten seconds, all over. Okay, that's what it does. And that's the end of it. So yeah. Yeah, they have to have a point to them. And as you say, the human interaction side is what really, for a pack animal like a dog, is absolutely essential. Incredibly exactly. essential. And, and that's the problem we're going to have as, as we come out of lockdowns, isn't it? Because all these people who bought themselves lockdown puppies because they have more time to spend at home at the moment are then going to realise, well, they're not going to realise, but they're, they're, their dogs are going to realise their owners aren't around anymore and they're going to struggle. I think it's already happening. I mean, it's been happening for a while, and you know, you get some of these dogs who have not been socialised. They, um, they suddenly, you know, going going out in the car, never seen that before. Mm. If it hasn't done before, that's you know, that, that, that socialisation window. It's going to be difficult getting right there. And we see terrified dogs um, in the car park. You know, it's just like, you know, how is that going to come back again? Uh, and it's it's not a, a badly social animal. is not a pleasure to anybody, and actually can be in dog case really pretty dangerous. Mm. Yes, yes, incredibly so. We, we've sadly had to put two dogs to sleep over the last eight months that have become so incredibly aggressive um, mm. that, that they've been unmanageable and we can't, in clear conscience, rehome them because that's just passing the problem on. We've had behaviourists involved who said that, that there's nothing they can do. Yep. Uh, and we don't know that these dogs would have been any different in, in other circumstances, but it's a pretty safe assumption that, that they would. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it is just sad. I mean, it's it, uh, always like dogs. I've always had dogs. Uh, and you, you see that happening. So that is the answer to, you know, exotic animals. It's all husbandry based. You know, that's, um, it's all pets. It's all husbandry. It's all how you look after and what you do with them. Um, mm. It doesn't matter what you keep. If you keep it badly, it's going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, I was out yesterday and... Um, I was away from my dog for for several hours, and I started to get really anxious. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I think she was she was worried about me being being away, you know, whether I would be all right or not. And I saw yeah. real separation anxiety. It's going to be with changes, isn't it? It's, it's going to be um, bright. And again, with dogs, you know, they're normally okay. You know, if you've got um, dogs who are used to, you know, you have a pattern of the owners, maybe six seven hours. But, you know, as long as they're, you know, they're well trained, you know, they're used to that, that pattern, the routine gets into it, they're often pretty okay with that. Mm. Poppy, Poppy was it. fine. Poppy. Poppy was fine with it. She was worried about me. Mm. Uh, yes. So, uh, she's, she's a dog. She, she worries about me. And she worries about how I'm going to cope with separation anxiety when I go out. Yeah. Yeah. She wants you to be safe at home where she yes. can keep an eye on you. Yes. yes. Yeah. And then obviously socialising you, Mike, is going to be a different matter altogether to get well, used to that. that. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm. I mean, you know, the yeah. cats next door were discussing it, and they, they said that they'd got no difficulty with their owners at all. In fact, <laughs> they were waiting for their owners to go out again. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's the trouble. You know, if, if a dog goes and get a new, gets a new owner in lockdown, you know, what hope do they have? I mean, we've all advised them not to do it, and you know, there they go. And the one difference I would say with dogs and cats is certainly with reptiles, is you don't, because they're, they're not warm-blooded. You don't have to be very far out with your husbandry to cause a bit more of a problem. So, you know, it can be just one degree. And so the monitoring's got to be a bit more precise. Whereas a dog or a cat, it really doesn't, you know, you've got a little bit more leeway, a bit more flexibility. But that that's yeah, you know, that, that, that's, that's the only difference, really. It's just a degree of subtlety. Mm. Mm. Although Steve Divers always used to say, uh, there's no such thing as a reptile emergency. <laughs> he still does say that. He still, still does, does say that. They are uncommon. Um, and generally, actually, um, I did do some good. I wonder, again, another positive from, from, from the lockdown is that um, there a lot more CPD from abroad and stuff and done things like that. I did list a great talk on reptile emergencies uh, from somebody in the States. And actually, one of the things is you know, one thing if you are dealing with reptile emergencies, why does somebody die? Because actually, an awful lot of them actually dead already, but they haven't worked it out. Um, but there are cases which are genuine emergencies. You can do something about it. Um, there are a few. They are, they are much rarer than the others. You generally got a bit more time with a reptile. Of course, that depends on how, many, how long it's been left for before it comes in. Mm. Um, so there, there, there are emergencies out there, definitely. I did have a colleague who 
never quite enjoyed doing on call with, with the rest of us. Not that it's really very enjoyable doing on call, but um, <laughs> it's a point reptiles at university. And then she did actually come to me and they said, yeah, I did see one last night. It's a good job we're on call. We really saved that one. It really was an emergency. <laughs> 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 I do have a they, they do. They do. Although I, I always remember when I worked with Steve Divers, um, he was sent a, a python through to do a post-mortem on it, this chap had a collection of them. And he started doing the post-mortem, realised it was still alive. So <laughs> he it up, put it onto fluids and it made a full recovery. Yeah, uh, they, they are quite giving sent through the yeah. post. Yeah, I mean, actually, the awkward one I had, we, we did have one with an anaesthetic overdosage and, um, and a very, very tiny tortoise. And it was, we found no signs of life after. It was very, very, very sad and everything. And so I sent it home and the owner was tardy getting to bury it. And um, two days later, it just got up and walked away. And this recovered all the time. It phoned me up and said about it. I said, what <laughs> yeah. It's not what you can say, really. <laughs> not much rating, is it? <laughs> You bring up a check, and actually, it was. I mean, we we completed a surgery, thank goodness, and the surgery went absolutely fine. So that was mm. good. But, um, yeah, it's it's a bit bit weird, and they are very strange. Like it is quite difficult determining death sometimes. Yes. Again, a, years ago, I had a I had a tortoise seem to die, and um, in the end, we put the color flow Doppler on the heart, and actually got some. We saw some fluid moving in there, and just kept on going reviving, and got that one through. But they're not they're not easy determining things. I've got a I've got a CPD certificate for tonight. Have you? You got one, yeah, yeah, cool. Good. So, because I think we've well, we've, we've done good... we've done CPD, we've had the reflection, and mm, yeah. now we need to present something as a CPD. So here we go. What you got? What, what you done so, today? What, what we got? It says certificate of hard shelled goodness. This certifies that all you lucky people who have been cool enough to watch or listen have learned stuff. And uh, there's a picture that, that's that's my home built vivarium for my two tortoises. And that's one of them enjoying a little little meal of kibble, which we only feed on their birthdays. Julian, you, you put sea urchins on the certificate. I know. I, I figured we might fit them in somehow. So there we go, sea urchins, a couple of sea urchins there. That's a Greek sea urchin. That's a, a, a gazepan sea urchin, the gazepan. So, so not, on, not only did you bet yourself a, a glass of whiskey that you could get sea urchins into the show, you even included them on the CPD certificate. I was that certain. However, I think you'll find it pretty amazing further on because look, we've got sugar gliders. Now it's a fairly safe bet, wasn't it, that we get sugar gliders on? Well, especially as you asked the question. Yeah. I know, absolutely. Uh, there's an asparagus beetle, and unfortunately I didn't get asparagus into it. <laughs> but there's an asparagus beetle. There's a chameleon. But look at that. There is a fossil. Yay. There we go. And you mentioned fossils right at the beginning before I even mentioned it. So. So I, I, I expect the five in the post. Brilliant. Um, Nailed that one. Yeah. I must admit, about that certificate, it's very lovely, and it does rather put your protestation about how busy you are, Julian, in some degree. <laughs> of <way. laughs> Come on, then. Have you got a joke for us, then, Julian? Uh, I have. It's not a very good one. There never are, but what is it tonight? <laughs> well, it, it's, one, um, it's one that someone reminded me of earlier about, um, about the old actor who's... Uh, he hasn't been called for a part for about 20, 20 years. Uh, and out of the blue, his agent gives him a buzz and says, um, says Ralph, or whatever his name is, Ralph, we've got a, we've got a part for you. Said, I'll, I'll take it. He said, well, you don't know what it is yet. I don't care. I'll take, I'll take it. Is, is, is it stage or screen? It's, it's a stage play. And it's, um, uh, from, it's a revolutionary stage play. So from, from the, uh, from the uh, French Revolution. And you only have one line but you open the play i'll do it i'll do it dear boy whatever I said, well okay so your line is hark i hear the cannons roar all right fair enough hark, I, and then the curtains will open and behind you there'll be this scene of of of, uh, of complete devastation as the revolution take over okay okay I'll, I'll do it i'll do it so he goes and sees the director he said what what what's my um what what Tell me more about this role. What, what, what's just, just just it's one line, okay? It's not important. Just you know, it's over in a second. Hark! I hear the cannons roar. Whatever you like. You're an old bloke listening to to these cannons. Curtains open, and off you go. We don't see you anymore. 
well, yeah, but I, I must, I must have a bit more than that. Just, you're, you're an experienced actor. Just, just think of your own Uber for it. All right, all right, I will, I will. And he thinks, well, what, what should, I, should I be John Gilgood? Oh, I hear the cannons roar. No, 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 no. Brian Blessed. Oh, I hear the cannons roar. No, 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 no. I, I, I know. And he goes through all these actors and things. I, I, I know. Oh, what? I, hark! I hear the the, the cannons roar. Yes, that's the one I'll do it. In. And so the, the opening night comes, and he's breathing behind the, the, the wings. Of, there we go. There we go. Jimmy is off. Out he goes. The lights are off in the auditorium. He thinks, I will do the Brian Blessed. A single spotlight lights up his face. And he thinks, I will say it. Oh, God, I hear that. Yes, that's it. It will, it will be Brian Blessed. It's Hark, I hear it's Larry, Larry, Hark, I hear yeah, that kind of, so there's a boom, and he says, what the hell was that? And there was a tumbleweed comes across. I guess you miss the applause of a live audience, don't you, Julian? I do. I do. It's, it's, a, it's a tough audience, actually. Actually, one thing, if I'm allowed to do a bit of a plug tonight for something. Yes, of course you can. Okay, yeah. fine. So it's very much, I'm, 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 I'm now a, uh, I'm a post BSA real life. I'm actually now a trustee of Bet Life. So again, to say to people that you know, Bet Life is there, and um, it is for people are having a pretty hard time, and it, it is there for people who are not doing so well. And uh, if you're having a, want somebody to talk to, that's what Bet Life's there for. And also, if you are doing back and when we get going with fundraising and doing practice activities, and things is don't forget to please do stuff for Bet Life. Thanks, John. Actually, that's it's a very important thing to say. Vet life for people who uh, who, who don't know, who don't, aren't in the profession. Vet life is a sort of Samaritans for, for vets and their families. Um, that they they do an awful lot of, of good other than just operating a phone system, uh, where where they'll give phone advice uh, twenty four hours a day for for vets and families of vets. It used to be the Veterinary Benevolent Fund, and it's similar yeah. to other, yeah. other groups too. But um, yes, yeah, so it's there for financial support um, and for um, uh, mental health support, and um, occasionally even even physical physical health support comes in that as well. So it is there for people who need help. That, that's what it's there for. There's a phone line, um, and, and um, everything else will be directed from there. And uh, a lot of volunteers who do a hell of a lot of work for it. And um, yeah, even even um, a brief period in there, you realise just just how hard that job must be. Yeah, it's yeah, very, very hard. Very, very the, the, hard. the veteran profession, un unfortunately, has, uh, is it first or second now? Are we, are we the highest or the second highest suicide rate? We've been, we've been the highest for, for donkey's years. Um, mm. It's been, been for a very long time. It's a worldwide thing too, but actually that's, it's one of those things where we, we don't try to do too, too much on that thing of it, because um, although it's a, it's a it's a horrifically startling figure, is actually the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the more, you know, the mood disorders, whether it be actual mental health disorders, there, there are massive other problems as well. Well, if anyone is suffering from mental health problems, uh, please know that you're, you're not alone. There is help well, out well, there. Exactly. And more importantly, is that you often don't know you are. So if you're having a bad time, there is somebody on me on the phone to talk to. Um, and hopefully all practices now have the number up advertising that if not it's on the internet please call it and so you don't have to be actually suffering you can be just having a bad time uh, and you, you get help before we talked about this earlier weren't we get help mm. before it gets too bad if you're reaching Absolutely. a stage where you know, you're actually really ill with it it's gone a long way too if you want to call before that it's just much more important yeah yeah the worst thing you can do is ignore yeah so here we go john th thank you Thank you so much for that, actually. But yeah. uh, thank you for the whole evening. It's been yeah, tremendous fun. I've enjoyed it too. I, I, I have, have I've missed our conversation in meetings, Julian. And uh, actually, I, it's a really nice to meeting Mike come before when we, uh, we were playing with horses and um, the whole sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having you on tonight, John. And uh, if uh, anybody listening or watching has enjoyed what they've seen or heard, don't forget to click like, share, get your friends involved. And don't forget to subscribe. So click the links below and uh, join in. And if you've got any topics that you want us to cover or any guests that you want us to meet and uh, discuss topics with, then drop us a line and we'll see what we can do. So, John, thank you so much indeed for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting with you this evening and listening to some of the stuff. 
and uh, I'll raise a glass to you and wish you may your dog you go too. with you may your dog go with you and yours as well thank you so we should have loose some fingers <laughs> <laughs> yes. well that, so it's a nod to, uh, to to our old friend Dave Allen yes. sadly miss Indeed. saw him live in London when I was a student and he was absolutely hilarious and cut <laughs> there we go <laughs> Have you enjoyed yourself, John? Yeah, yeah. That was um, that was fun. I thought quite expected, but I didn't know what I did expect anyway. So, kind of goes against that. But yeah, we we, we never know what to expect either. It's um, it's different the, every night. It, it is the, the the prime objective is to have fun. There is a small objective to have a bit of CPD because that's our tagline. But really, it all started uh, from a, the objective of having fun and getting a bit of CPD out there. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think it's something we, we forget a lot, isn't it? We forget to actually enjoy it. it, 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 it yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. some good bits there. And, um, yeah, it's nothing. And uh, I think it's probably a bit I've missed most in the last year is um, you know, I like going to conferences and stuff like that. I miss meeting people and um, having that bit of fun. 